This morning, as we come to the study of God's Word, we want to take this moment to stop and ask the Lord to speak clearly to us from that Word. And as we have begun this initiative, we're also praying for a, a ministry that is a part of the body of the gathering here. And this morning, we're praying for ELM Pregnancy Center. That's the Education Life Mothers Pregnancy Center. That's actually was the first pregnancy center ever opened up here in northern Chiang Mai, in northern Thailand at all. And they, they, provide, they provide help and support for young ladies that are having an unexpected pregnancy. They, they teach on the, the value of life that God has. And also they teach them about the gospel of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that he has available to them through his son, Jesus. Let's, let's pray now and ask God to speak to us this morning, even as we ask him to bless and provide for this ministry. Bow with me, won't you? Father, now is your time. And God, we want to hear you speak this morning as we continue and begin wrapping up this series on the armor that you have provided for us. Father, we want to hear you speak today. God, we know that your word is very clear that your Bible is spiritually discerned and that we need your help. We need the Holy Spirit to help us understand what it is you want us to know today. So, Father, would you do that? We know that you're here. For, God, that you promise that you will be here among us and you are in us, those that have been born again through faith in your son, Jesus. But God, we're asking for a special understanding of your word this morning. That you would give us ears that can hear and hearts that will respond. Father, we also want to bring before you this ELM Pregnancy Center. God, this ministry that you yourself have started to reach out to those needy young ladies. Father, that have value in your eyes and that oftentimes are considered unvalued in the world. To rescue them and to rescue that unborn baby that you have a plan for, that you formed in their womb. Their womb. God, would you provide for this ministry as they need? Would you speak through them, Father, and draw the, the ladies that need to hear this truth and need this support? Why, Father, would you put them together? that your gospel and your kingdom would expand here in northern Thailand in a very real way in the lives in each and every one of the individuals represented through this ministry. God bless them mightily, we pray. And it's in the name of Jesus we come before you, God. Amen. We are in Ephesians chapter 6. Should probably come as no surprise. We've been there for several weeks now, and Lord willing, we will have it for this Sunday and one more as we discuss the forgotten weapon and the forgotten part of the armor of God prayer. But this morning, we're covering the sword of the Spirit. Let's read together Ephesians chapter 6, verses 16 and 17 this morning. In all circumstances, the Apostle Paul writes, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, as we've been studying the armor of God for these many weeks, there's a theme that we've seen over and over and over, something that God wants us to clearly understand, and that theme is this. To put on the armor of God is simply this, to trust in Jesus and to walk with Him in His ways. See, the armor of God is not separate from the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, whose strength are we supposed to live in? It's Jesus's. Whose truth do we wrap our lives around like a belt? It's Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Whose breastplate of righteousness do we wear? It's Jesus's. It's not ours. Who has readied our feet with the gospel of peace? Jesus has, through His death, burial, and resurrection. Who is it we are supposed to kneel behind as a shield of faith and let him extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one? It's Jesus. And finally, as we saw last week, 
whose helmet of salvation are we actually wearing? It's Jesus' helmet. When he declared, I saw no one who could save, and so with my mighty right arm, I saved. It is all about walking with Jesus. Why? Because Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church and said this exact truth. He said, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Who is it that guards us against Satan? It's Jesus. He's faithful. Even when we're not, he is faithful. And he will guard us against the evil one. The armor of God is not something separate from the person of Jesus Christ. It's part of walking in Him, abiding in Him. When Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will be with you, He wasn't lying. And He knows we have this enemy who wants to attack and deceive and devour us. And He says, I am with you. But as we come to this specific piece of the armor of God, God says, I want you to be more than just protected. I want you to be more than a conqueror as you walk with me and are in me. Look at this verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. What? Through him who loved us. See, God has given us this defensive armor, but now as the Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, continues to write, he says, but you know what? We also have an offensive weapon. It's both defensive and offensive. It is the sword of the Spirit. King Jesus has given you the sword of the Spirit, which Paul defines for us, which is the Word of God. Those of us who have come to Jesus by faith, repented of our desire to run our own life, repented of the sin in which we walked away from God and done our own things and sinned against God's law, those of us who have turned and repented of that and come to Jesus and asked Him to forgive us because Jesus has died on the cross for our sins and we've received His forgiveness, we now have this armor. And that includes this sword. If someone here this morning that has never asked Jesus to be their Lord and Savior and turned from their sins and begged God for, to forgive them and received his forgiveness, you have no protection against the evil one. But God does not want you to be devoured by Satan. He desires that you join him, join his kingdom, be a part of his family, and be born again through faith in his son, Jesus. And Jesus, your king, wants to be with you and protect you from all that this world has against us. And so Paul says, in all circumstances, pick up the shield of faith, but also in all circumstances, take up the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. This morning, we're going to look at just those few verses, those few words there in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, and we're going to break down in three phrases, the sword, the sword of the Spirit, and the Word of God. And we're going to see what Paul is saying to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's going to, we're going to answer three specific questions this morning. How are we supposed to use this God's Word as the sword. What does that look like? How are we going to use this sword correctly? How do we know if we're using God's Word correctly or incorrectly when we're using it as a sword? And finally, what are the effects that we will see when we see God's Word used correctly as a sword? How do you use it as a sword? How do you use it correctly? And what are we going to see when this happens? Those are the three questions we're going to see this morning. But the first thing we need to do is look at this word sword. Now, when you think of a sword, how many of you have ever held a sword? Okay, how many of you have ever touched a really sharp knife? There we go. Okay, a lot more hands came up. When you, maybe you're at a marketplace, maybe at a store that is selling swords or even sharp knives, and you pick one up, what's the first thing that that seller says as they come running up to you? 
Be careful. Right. Why? It's sharp. What is he saying? He's saying, or she might be saying, hey, danger. Watch out. You may unknowingly hurt yourself. That is a dangerous thing. And it's interesting because that's the word God uses to describe his own word. See, the world wants us to think of the Bible as just this word of, of this book of knowledge, is really good teachings. Wow, some of it makes a whole lot of sense. No, how does God describe his own word? He says it's dangerous. It's like a sword. He describes his word not as a lifeless book of wisdom, but as his word indwelled with his power, and it is unstoppable. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, we see this. God says, my word that goes out from my mouth shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed the thing for which I sent it. What is he saying? He's saying it's dangerous. And when I speak my word, God says, it will accomplish what I've purposed. It won't come back to me empty and saying, I couldn't accomplish that, God, no. Anything God says will be unstoppable. So if we apply it to what we've been studying, we see this. God's Word is dangerous to anything that is against His kingdom or anyone that is against His kingdom. It is a sword. But what kind of sword? Because I believe that when Paul chose this word, the Holy Spirit's telling him exactly what to say. That the word choice he used for sword is important because, you know what? We missed one. There it is. The word he uses is important. See, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, in the Greek translation, there's two types of swords mentioned. There's one which is this really long sword, and it was used during a time of war, and it was two-handed, and you used it for big, sweeping violence. But that's not the word he uses. He talks about the machaira, other in Latin it's called the gladius. It's the sword that the one-handed sword that the Roman soldiers would strap to their waist, to strap to their belt in a sheath, and walk carrying it with them all the time. It's the, it's the same type of sword that the Philippian jailer had on him when Paul and Silas were arrested and placed into prison. It's the type of sword that Peter carried when he chopped off Malchus's ear the night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. It's that type of sword. It's a one-handed, precise instrument. Because what I believe God is saying here as we understand what type of sword this Word of God is, I believe it's talking about precision. And we see that in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Now, we're not going to read all the way through verse 11. Actually, no, let's read that. We have time this morning. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And let's look and see how Jesus used the Word of God as that precise, one-handed, accurate sword. Matthew chapter 4, starting with verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took Jesus to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And Satan said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, 
And behold, angels came and were ministering to Jesus. Now, now I know there's a lot going on here, and we don't have time this morning to break it down and to see really deeply what's happening in this interaction. But this is a spiritual battle that Jesus is facing. The Bible says the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness in order to be tempted by Satan. Jesus was set up purposefully to have this spiritual battle. And there's a lot of different reasons why that happens that Scripture tells us. But there's one thing I want us to see here that pertains to the word that Paul uses about a sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's how Jesus uses the Word of God. He uses it specifically and precisely. He says three times, for it is written. And then he uses an exact passage from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, and then other places where he just says, right there, it says in the Word of God that this is the truth. And it applies directly to the temptation that Satan is bringing to him. It is a precise, one-handed instrument. Jesus didn't use the Word of God with like the two-handed sword, just broadly making true but big statements. He didn't say, oh, Satan, my father's a loving God, and he loves me, and everything will be okay. Now, that's true, but it's not as effective as that one-handed, precise, let me show you Scripture, Satan, for it is written and precisely uses the Word of God, like a Mahira, that actual, accurate Defense and offense. Now, how does it defend? We see it right there. Jesus speaks the truth from God's Word in this specific passage that deals with what Satan is saying, and he blocks it. He says, that doesn't even, doesn't even tempt me, Satan, because look at what my Father says. And when Jesus says, if for it is written, he is saying, it is a done deal. My Father spoke the truth, and I believe it a hundred percent. Simply the fact that it is written is enough defense. But then notice, it's also an offense. See, if we say, not offense as in it offended anybody, but an offense is an attack, a counterattack, a parry. See, because if we say, my father loves me and it's going to be all okay, that doesn't stop Satan's attack. Because he'll come at you and say, well, yeah, he's loving to other people, but not to you. And he'll try to switch switch things and twist things. But Jesus didn't allow that to happen. He said, look, right here, this verse exactly applies to this situation. And Satan did what? He left. He fled. He had to try another way. That temptation ended right there. And I believe that is what Paul is saying when he calls the Word of God the one-handed, precise sword of the Spirit. He says it needs to be used with precision. How do we use the Word of God as a sword of the Spirit? We use it with precision. We say, Satan, here's the temptation you're trying to say, but here's what my Father has said exactly about this. And I'm going to believe my Father over you. I'm going to trust that God is true. We can see this in Acts chapter 13 in the life of Paul. Paul is just starting his ministry. In fact, he's still called Saul at this point. In Acts chapter 13, starting with verse 6, we see Paul and Barnabas. He's referred to Saul at this point, but it's the same person. It says, when they, that's Saul and Barnabas, had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. See what's happening? This Gentile commander is calling Barnabas and Saul and saying, I want to hear about this word of God that you have. But Elymas, the magician, for that's the meaning of Bar-Jesus' name, opposed them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at this man, Elymas, 
and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Paul understood immediately what's going on. This is a spiritual battle. And we fight spiritual battles with spiritual weapons. And so he turned to Elymas and said, Listen, Isaiah 40 says, Make straight the paths of the Lord. And you are trying to make crooked paths so that this man will not believe. Paul used the Word of God specifically. You want to see the power of God show up in your life against the temptations of Satan? Quote, Scripture. Accurate, pertinent, precise Scripture. When this temptation comes, you say, Satan, for it is written, bam, and you will see Satan flee. Now, he'll come back. He'll try another way. But he'll stop in that one way, because why? He knows he cannot defeat the power of God in the Word of God. The sword of the Word of God is most effective when it is used precisely. In fact, this is exactly what the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, his disciple, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says this, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. Look at these words. Rightly handling the word of truth. You know what? If you look up in the Greek of that, that word rightly handling is, literally means this. Cut straight. That's what it means. You want to be a person who is being approved, not ashamed of how you hold God's word, but no, you cut straight with it. You know how to open it and know what it says, and you know how to use it when it's pertinent, precise. The man of God is approved when he wears, not only wears the sword, but knows how to use it, to block and attack and say, Satan, it is written, and watch Satan flee. But okay, Pastor Jeff, how do we know what verse to use, right? I mean, are we supposed to just memorize the whole Bible and then hope we can figure it out? Are we that smart? Is, is what you're saying here is it's based upon our own wisdom? No. That's the second part of the point. It is the sword of the Spirit, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. It's the sword of the Spirit. If you looked back in Acts 5, 13, you would see that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit when he turned and used the sword precisely. See, the role of the Holy Spirit is to help us know what's going on and remind us of all the things that Jesus has said. In fact, that's what Jesus promised. Jesus said, when I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. It's better for you that I go away, because when I go, I'm going to send the Helper who will be with you, and He will bring to mind all that I have said. If you want the Holy Spirit to be working in your life and helping you defeat Satan, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, we can actually overcome, just like Paul said to the Romans, be an overcomer. Not just stand and defend, but also attack and push back. It is listening to the Holy Spirit remind you of those verses that you've read in the Word of God. See, to take up the Holy Spirit's sword is to fill your mind with the Word of God. How can, how can God remind you of something you haven't read yet? The idea of reminding means you know it. It's already there. It's just brought to the front. See, Paul says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It is the sword of the Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit's sword. You know, some Bible scholars, when they look at this word spirit, they think, oh, well, Paul's just saying that the, the, the Word of God is a spiritual thing. And that's true. But you know what? The whole armor of God is spiritual. No, I believe that when he says this is the sword of the Spirit, he is specifically saying this Word of God belongs to the Holy Spirit, not to you and me. And you know what? We're seeing that abused today. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. God tells us who wrote 
the Bible. Peter says this, know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. We just shared this at Logos Academy. No prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. We don't get to say what the Bible means. Nope. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the what? The Holy Spirit. By the who? The Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is the one who wrote God's Word, and the Holy Spirit is the one who gets to tell us what God's Word means and when to use it and how to use it. It's the Holy Spirit's Word of God, the sword that He carries, that He indwells with His own power. People today are trying to listen to the lies of Satan and say the Bible is just this book of wisdom and we can say whatever it, we think it might be and we can take some worse verses out and we can redefine. What, no, that's why we say here all the time at the gathering, let the Bible define what the Bible says. If you don't understand what the Bible says in this passage, keep reading, go for the context, look at other places because the Bible never contradicts itself because it is the Word of God. People are walking around helpless because they are voiding the power of the Word of God. But Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6, gives us wisdom and a warning. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. I'm sorry, there's a lot of passages I want to cover this morning, so I hope your, your hands and your thumbs are moving quick. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6 says this, Every word of God proves true. Let me say that again. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Notice the word of God is a Him. We'll get to that in a moment. Do not add to His words, lest He rebuke you and you be found a liar. If you look at the book of Revelation, chapter 22, you'll see that God has some more warnings about those who detract from or add to God's word. No, we don't get to say what the Word of God means. We get to hear what God says His Word means because it's the Holy Spirit's Word and it's the Holy Spirit's sword. Every Word of God proves true because it is indwelled by the Holy Spirit and it is powerful and it is dangerous. Jesus told the Pharisees of His day, he said, when you consider the traditions of man, you are voiding the Word of God. He says, for your traditions that you're trying to uphold, you're voiding the Word of God. What is he saying? He's saying, you're considering tradition as more important than even the Word of God. And so it has no power for you against Satan. May that not be said of us. Because we are to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And we are to believe that God's Word is true. And we are to listen to the Holy Spirit telling us, remember that verse you read this morning? Here's why you read it. I know it's happened in my life, and I'm sure it's happened in quite a few. You don't have to raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But how often have we had a quiet time one morning, and then sometime at around lunchtime, we need, or talking to somebody, and that exact verse we read is now something that we are thinking about and sharing? It's amazing. Because the Word of God is indwelled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And He knows what it is we're reading. He's leading us, and then He's reminding us what we just read. We are taking up the, shield, the sword of the Spirit. How do we use it as a sword? We use it precisely. We fill our minds with the Word. We carry it with us every day. And we listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit to tell us this verse right now. And then we use it. But how do we know if we're using it correctly? That's the second question. How do we know if we're using the Word of God correctly? Well, there's several checks, but I'm just going to give you three briefly this morning. Since the Holy Spirit owns the sword, that's the sword of the Spirit. It's His. He indwells it. He wrote it. He reminds us of it. He upholds it by its, His power. He uses it in us in our lives and to protect us against Satan. Since it's His, then there's three questions we should ask ourselves when we are using God's Word. The first one is this. 
is how we're using God's word defeating the kingdom of Satan. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, asks this question and gives us some wisdom there. Are we using God's word to defeat the kingdom of Satan? Is it defeating what God has said is against his kingdom? Verse 3 there of 2 Corinthians 10 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. It's both defensive and offensive. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. That's the Word of God. And take every thought captive to obey Christ. In other words, we take every word, every thought, every circumstance, and we compare it to the Word of God. And we ask ourselves, do our thoughts and our actions and our feelings reflect what we see in God's Word? Because if not, we change our thoughts. We take every thought captive. We change our opinions and our feelings. We don't do it the other way around. We don't say, well, I feel this, so obviously the Bible should be wrong. I've actually actually had somebody tell me that. Well, I feel this way, so God must be wrong. And he was a previous pastor. Sad. Because now that man is helpless to defend against Satan's attacks in his life. Helpless, because he has voided the power of God. The Apostle John tells us the reason Jesus came is to destroy the works of the devil. So if we're going to use God's Word, we have to use it for that purpose. That's the same purpose the Holy Spirit came, to destroy the works of the devil. So in other words, if I'm using the Bible so that I can make sin okay then I'm using it wrong. If I'm using God's Word, the Scripture, to promote greed or pursue things of this world, I'm using it wrong. And if I'm using my understanding of God's Word to abuse another person, then I'm using it in a way contrary to the one who owns it. It is the sword of the Spirit of the Word of of God. It is the sword that the Spirit owns. The Word of God is to be used to defeat Satan's kingdom, not build it up. So, how are we supposed to use God's Word when we see a brother or sister sinning? Well, we're supposed to build each other up. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 makes us ask, how are we using the Word of God in our own heart first? We have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word, but by open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Number one is be sure that when you see this person sinning, your heart is pure before God. And you're not coming to attack and tear down. But you are coming in saying, this is the truth and God is my witness that I love you and this is what God's Word says. I want to build you up. I don't want to tear you down. I don't want to use the God's Word to trick you into thinking something else. No, I just want to share with you what the Bible says. And then I'm going to take Galatians chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 to my heart. And I'm going to say, I want to restore you. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Paul says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Don't use the Word of God underhandedly to, to build you up and make you feel stronger. No, you use the Word of God with a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And we know the law of Christ is to love each other. So let me give you this word picture. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, we should use to protect each other from sin, not attack 
each other because of sin. The word picture I want you to think of is this. Take the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and hold it between Satan and you both. Not between you and them. You use it to protect against Satan, and you restore that person gently. You stand up and say, God's Word says you don't have to live that way, that you have already forgiven, that you are a child of the King. Remember, we're talking about believers sinning. And you hold the sword of the Spirit against Satan and restore them gently. And you be careful, because you might be tempted too. Whatever sin that person is struggling with, you might be tempted with as well. So no, keep the sword out against Satan. It should never come between us. We are to build each other up. We are to bear one another's burdens. How can I bear your burden if I'm swinging a sword at you? No, I'm using it wrong. If I'm using it between you and me, I cannot bear your burden. Therefore, I'm sinning too. So if you see a brother or sister who's struggling with sin... You hold up the truth of God's Word, and you protect them from Satan. You hold it up between Satan and them, and you you say, listen, let me show you the lie that you're being deceived with, and let me restore you gently, because I want to care for you and hold your burden. If we do that, then we would be fulfilling the law of Christ. To restore someone means to gently bring them back under the protection of the Word of God to help them get to the feet of Jesus and thank Him for His forgiveness as they repent and turn from that. It's to cover the wounded in this spiritual battle, not create wounded with the sword. Which brings us to this final point. When we use the Word of God correctly, it will always point to the person of Jesus. This piece of God's armor is no different than any of the other pieces of God's armor. It's about Jesus. The Word of God points to Jesus. John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus says it very clearly. He turns to the Pharisees and He says this, You Pharisees search the Scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, but it is they that bear witness about me. Everything in the Word of God bears witness about Jesus. Jesus said, you, you, you think that in this knowledge you'll get, you find eternal life, but living the one who gives eternal life that the Father has allowed and purposed to give to whomever He wants eternal life, If you would come to me, you would know that the Scripture is all about me. They point to me. There's one other thing I want to show you back in Matthew chapter 4 in the time we have left. Because you know what? Paul uses a special word there in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17, but I'm going to show it to you in Matthew 4 first. Go back to Matthew chapter 4 and look at verse 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. I know it's not up here. I knew the list of verses was getting long, and I didn't want to scare you. Okay, so we've already been there in Matthew chapter 4. Let's look at just verse 4. Jesus answered Satan and says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I want you to notice something. Jesus does not say man shall live by every word that has come out of the mouth of God. He doesn't say man shall live by everything that God said a long time ago. No. In fact, the word that Jesus uses here is not the word that we use constantly when we think of the word of God, the Bible. The word of God in the scripture is logos, the totality of what God has said. But here he doesn't use that word. It's rema. It is the spoken utterance of my Father. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every utterance that comes out from God's worth, word, from God's mouth, sorry, right now. That's what he's talking about. 
He's talking about listening. When Jesus says, for it is written, he's doing what we should do as well. He's listening to the prompting of God and saying, this passage applies to this precise point. And I know it's true because my Father is saying it to me. He's saying, I'm listening to the rhema, the voice that is speaking to my heart right now, saying, this is my truth. And that's the exact same word that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7, 17. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the uttered Word of God. It will never contradict the written Word of God, the logos, the full, complete Word of God. But he says, it's a relationship that we're having. It is listening and walking with the spoken Word that God is saying to you right now. I've quoted this verse already. John 14, 26. The reason the Holy Spirit is given is so that He will bring to mind all that Jesus has said to us. Because then we'll hear it and we'll remember that's God speaking now. God speaking now. The uttered word in our lives, in your life and in my life, is to be listening and walking with God. Jesus, abiding in Jesus, letting Him speak to you through His Word. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. We're wrapping up now. The Hebrew writer is filled with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he's been talking about the written Word of God that was handed down to the Jews, and he's talking about the rest that they're seeking, and it's already been written what that rest will be, and then he says this, or she says this, based upon who you think wrote the book of Hebrews. For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Sound familiar? I hope so. Piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Even as the Hebrew writer is writing about the written word of God, he immediately flows into the living word of God. It's Jesus you can't separate the two. We aren't to seek, search God's Word in the hopes of finding eternal life. We are to search God's Word knowing that it points to Jesus, the holder and giver of eternal life. Jesus is the living Word of God. So how are we to be more than conquerors? We are to be reading God's Word and then listening to Jesus walk with us through the day and tell us what we need to know when we need to know it and apply it to our lives then. In closing, I want you to look at something you may not have looked at closely before. It's in 1 John chapter 2. We're going to end with this verse. 1 John chapter 2 verses 12 through 14. There we see John the Apostle giving us an understanding and an explanation of what it means to spiritually grow in the Lord. And he uses three different terms. He talks about little children, he talks about young men, and then he talks about fathers. And those are categories of spiritual maturity. Look what he says, starting with verse 12. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know who him, him who is from the beginning. And I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the Word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. There's more than we can cover in just a few moments we have left. But let me just show you what he's saying here. Little children, babies in Christ, they know two things. They don't know that their sins have been forgiven because of what Jesus Christ has done. And they know God is their Father. That's what they know. And mature Christians, those that John refers to as fathers, they know the one who is from the beginning. They don't think of God in terms of how He affects them. They think of God in terms of the ultimate almighty God who has always existed and always will exist. And they worship Him in that way. It's no longer about what God does for them. It's who God is. 
But somewhere in the middle, maybe where many of us are here this morning, there's the young men. And John says, you are the ones who have the Word of God abiding in you, and you've overcome the evil one. What a beautiful thought that we can mature in Christ simply by letting the Word of God abide in us, strapping that sword of the Spirit on, remembering that it's the Spirit sword. It's not something we can play with, but we listen to the Word of God in our minds and listen through the day for the Holy Spirit to remind us of what we read, and then we apply it, and we watch God Himself overcome the evil one and make Satan flee. For we are to resist the devil, and he will flee. And that's what Jesus did. And that's what God has for us. So let me encourage you this morning. Let's bow our heads right now. Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord, where are we on that spiritual maturity spectrum? Are we like the little children that constantly just need to be reminded that our sins are forgiven? because of what Jesus has done. Our sins are forgiven for His name. Are we simply only thinking of God as our Father and how He gives us things or doesn't give us things or loves us or doesn't love us and all those thoughts about the father-child relationship? Is that what our minds are filled with? Maybe we're like mature Christians, those fathers who it's not about us anymore. It's about God who has been been from the beginning and will always exist even when time ends and that we just want to know him and to know him more and more to be made like him as Paul was praying made like Jesus suffering in his death it's not about me anymore I just want to experience who God is maybe that's one of us here some of us here or are we those that John can look at us and say you're a young man you're a young lady you have the Word of God dwelling in you, and you have overcome the evil one. God, thank you for this morning and the reminder that your Word is so much more than just words on a page, that it is living and active and sharper than anything else we can ever think of, that it's dangerous against the kingdom of Satan. And Father, you want to use it to cut away those things in our lives that don't reflect your kingdom. Thank you for that. Because it's in that process that you're making us overcomers of the evil one. Father, this is something only you can do. Perform it in our hearts, we pray. And it's in the name of Jesus we ask. Amen.